kind of computer capabilities you have today and go back and look at computation in, say, 1990. Very simple way to, to let me bring this all the way down to, to, to computers for a second because we're talking about human computer interface. Moore's Law was articulated by Glenn Moore at Intel in 1962. He basically said, the amount of computing power you can buy per dollar doubles every 16 months. This seems to be technically true, and seems to be true going back to the 1890s. Now, every 16 months turns out to be a hundredfold increase per decade as a simple rounding process. Now, what does that mean? It means the amount of computing power you could buy in 1960, if that was one, for the same amount of money in 1970, you bought 100. In 1980, you bought 10,000. In 1990, you bought a million. In 2000, you bought 100 million units. And in 2010, you'll buy 10 billion. That's the lifespan of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. So our design process has to assume that the ship we're laying down will face competitors with access to 10 billion times the computing capacity per dollar. It turns out storage capacity is dropping at about the same rate or slightly faster. So what you begin having is massive data sets multiplied against massive computation, multiplied against a worldwide wireless system. So one of the examples I used for a couple of years because I, I picked it up at the Cleveland Clinic uh, they have an annual innovation uh, summit, and they asked me to come talk to them. And so I was meeting with various doctors and scientists. And I come up with the notion that, that 10 years from now, you'd be at a sporting event on a Saturday, and your pacemaker would call you. Because you'd have a heart pacemaker, which was wireless, connected to expert systems, routinely, all day, analyzing the data flow without you caring. And so you get this phone call on your cell phone, and your voice responsive heart pacemaker would say to you, I've been analyzing your data this morning, and it looks to us like you could be about three hours away from a heart attack. And we noticed that from your GPS locator on your cell phone that you are at the stadium on row 12, ILG, and so I've taken the liberty of ordering an emergency vehicle to come down to Gate C so we can get you to the hospital before you have a heart attack so we can preempt rehabilitation, you won't have any damage, much better for you. Being an American, you would promptly say, three hours, huh? <laughs> How about if I wait till half time? I mean, doesn't this sound the way it would be? Now, you find yourself suddenly negotiating with your pacemaker. <laughs> now, I'm going to carry a step further. I had used this story for two years, and I thought it was right at the edge of science fiction, a little bit out on it. And I, Plist and I were in Berlin at a uh, conference on health innovation in Europe, and I told the story. And immediately afterwards, a medical device manufacturer who makes pacemakers came running up to me and said, I'm so excited you're talking about wireless pacemakers. We've now installed 100,000 of them. Now, they're very primitive. They're first-generation pacemakers, which means you take the pacemaker in here is sending out a very weak audio signal or a very weak wireless signal. You take a second device, put it right about here. It interfaces with the telephone and your cardiologist anywhere in the world can read your data, no matter where you are. So you have, you have basically eliminated distance in being able to have very high quality analytics applied to what's happening to your heart. That's a current, that's a this generation technology, not 10 years from now. And I was sort of stunned because I, I thought I was pretty close to out on the edge and I'm just barely creeping ahead of the change. Now let me carry you two steps further because I, I want you to get this rhythm in, in, in your heads. I'm going to say one thing that I'd be interested to get the reaction, particularly from the faculty, about. I really believe one of the things we have to do is shift a substantial amount of our research money into a prize system rather than a process system. And the reason I want to do that is that we have gotten become very cumbersome in how many things we fill out, how many peer-reviewed panels there are, how much time we spend waiting, 
and, and peer-reviewed panels are by definition conservative in a small c sense. That is, they are risk-avoiding validators of the current knowledge. So there's a wonderful rule that Arthur C. Clarke developed. He's a great science fiction writer and the inventor of the uh, communication satellite. Uh, and uh, Clarke said, that the Arthur C. Clarke rule is, if a famous scientist tells you something can be done, they're almost certainly right. If they tell you something can't be done, you don't have a clue because historically they're very cautious and they're very often wrong. And, and he goes through a whole series of examples where great prestigious scientists did not believe something was possible. Now the reason I cite this is what I want to do is, is create, if, if we're correct and there's going to be four to seven times as much new science, I want to liberate the system so that, that people, uh, and I don't want to take all the money, but I'd like to take about 10% of the money that we're going to spend on research over the next quarter century and put it into prizes in a way that anybody can, can try. And what this will do is it will break down the barriers. Now let me, let me carry you through this just for a couple of extra minutes. 1903, the Wright brothers in Dayton, Ohio, who are bicycle mechanics, at a time when being a bicycle mechanic is a high-end capability, have been studying flight for years. They've studied birds, they've built their own wind tunnel, and they decide they're going to go and try to fly. And they go to the Weather Service and find the best place to fly in the United States is Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, because you have more wind coming up the hill than any place else, and you need the uplift to fly. So they buy enough wood in Dayton to go to Kitty Hawk, because back then you went by train, it was a long way away, you, you were very isolated at Kitty Hawk. They took enough wood to wreck the plane three or four or five times a day and rebuild it. Because their working assumption was, we know the direction, I want you to think about this, it's very important in technological change. We know the direction we're going in, but we don't know enough to plan. And so we're going to go out and try it. it. It literally is think, act, plan in that order. Because the action teaches you the thing you should be planning, and then you go back and you think, act, plan again. And so they start doing this, and, and they are literally almost works, didn't quite work, what happened, let's think about it, okay, we'll fix this, now let's try it again. In November of 1903, the plane flies a distance shorter than the wingspan of a Boeing 747 at a slow enough speed that the brother who's not piloting is running next to it to make sure it doesn't tip over. But it flew. And from proof of concept, they rapidly improved it. By 1908, they flew around this. Most people had never seen a plane at all. They'd read about it in AP stories. In 1908, they have improved the plane enough that it flies all the way around the island of Manhattan and is seen by over a million and a half people. In 1913, Winston Churchill, who's the most technologically aggressive politician in the 20th century, learns how to fly. The airplane's 10 years old. And here he is, his first Lord of the Admiralty, learning how to fly. It is such a dangerous air vehicle in 1913 that his instructor is killed later that summer. And it's interesting to speculate if Churchill had been killed, how history would have been different. Churchill, by the way, is such an aggressive innovator in technology that as first Lord of the Admiralty in charge of the Royal Navy, he invents the tank. Because he intuits that what you need is an internal combustion engine with tracks in order to get across the the front in World War I. And so he finds the money in the Navy budget to build a tank. And is the, so he does all this in passing. He's, he's one of those rare people who just got it all. He, understood, he intuitively understood science and technology. Now here's the purpose of my telling you about the Wright brothers. The same summer that the Wright brothers had taken enough wood to crash, the Smithsonian, with much more prestige and much more sophisticated scientists, had gotten a $50,000 grant. The Wright brothers, by the way, are doing this on their own money as a hobby. The Smithsonian had gotten a $50,000 grant from Congress to invent an airplane on behalf of the Navy. And they needed to get the speed up because they, they didn't think about going to Kitty Hawk. And so they needed to get enough wind under the wings to raise it. And so they developed a catapult that would launch the plane. And they decided they would launch it over the Potomac. Now, I want you to think as a, as a test in logic here. 
If the Wright brothers are expecting to crash the plane multiple times and rebuild it, 